a road to announcer. Being but, a page? Yes. What was that? Well, I guess just getting in, learning the business, so, but fellows that wanted to, to become an announcer could just walk in green never even been an announcer and say, well, you do it. Well, next time I see Lord, I'll have to tell him. I thought that was a big deal, but I'll have to tell him. You said everybody did. <laughs> I always thought that was a major step. But. No, they would work with I don't say it all, but this was a lot of They were getting in. There were the studios around there, and the studio audience was staring in and all the way. You see? Audition. I'm glad I never had to take the radio radio audition. I would have flunked badly. Oh, why? Oh, yeah, yeah, because they had, it was a really tongue twister, and they had in there all kinds of names and classical music and things of this kind and foreign words. Did you pronounce they were worried about your pronunciation? Yeah, yeah. and my, uh, my audition was considerably different. Is that the president dismissed as a particular thing I, having hitchhiked my way to a dozen stations, nine, eight, 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 I frustratedly said, how the devil does a guy get to be a sports four, announcer if he can't get a job three, on radio station? And got to the studio door and over the other elevator door, and there was a wonderful old man who was on canes, he was very arthritic call up with me and he says, what was that you said about sports? I told him that's what I wanted to do. And he said, do you know anything about football? I said, I played for eight years. He took me in a studio, he stood me in front of the microphone. He said, I'll be in another room listening. When the light comes on, you broadcast an imaginary football game. <laughs> and I did. <laughs> It wasn't really imaginary. I took one of the games of football. I played in it. This was right out of college, the previous fall of college. This is a test of the audio circuit. We won the last 20 seconds. President Reagan's radio address will begin in four minutes. And in the last 20 seconds there, I, as a running guard, was supposed to take out the first man of the secondary and the play wouldn't work. And Bud Cole came out, went through and won 65 yards for a touchdown. And I never knew how he did it because I missed my man. I didn't block him. But on that broadcast, I did. I delivered a block. Did you use your name? Did you say? Of course. <laughs> seconds. It's on 10 seconds. Stand by. My fellow Americans, this has been a busy and eventful week for Nancy and me. Now that the summit in Geneva is behind us, we need to look ahead and ask, where do we go from here? As I told Congress, we've made a fresh start in U.S.-Soviet relations. Every issue was on the table, and our 15 hours of discussions were tough and lively throughout. I got a better perspective from listening to General Secretary Gorbachev, and I think he went home with a lot to think about, too. I plan to meet Mr. Gorbachev again next year in Washington. But between now and then, we have much work to do. Opportunities to address important problems of Soviet-American relations should not be squandered. We must always be realistic about our deep and abiding differences, but we should be working for progress wherever possible. On arms control, the Soviets, after several years of resisting talks, have now agreed that each side should cut nuclear arms by 50% in appropriate categories. 
And in our joint statement, we called for early progress on this, directing the emphasis of the talks toward what has been the chief U.S. goal all along, deep, equitable, fully verifiable reductions in offensive weapons. If there's real interest on the Soviet side, there's a chance the talks can begin to make headway. Mr. Gorbachev and I discussed our work on SDI, America's Strategic Defense Initiative. I told him that we're investigating non-nuclear defensive systems designed to destroy offensive missiles and protect people. Although reluctant to acknowledge it, the Soviets have been carrying forward a research program far more extensive than ours on their own version of SDI. I think it's fair to point out that the Soviets' main aim at Geneva was to force us to drop SDI. I think I can also say that after Geneva, Mr. Gorbachev understands we have no intention of doing so. Far from it, we want to make strategic defense a strong protector of the peace. A research and testing program that may one day provide a peace shield to protect against nuclear attack is a deeply hopeful vision. And we should all be cooperating to bring that vision of peace alive for the entire world. Regional conflicts were prominent in our discussions, and we'll be watching very closely for any change in Soviet activities in the Third World. Another resounding vote of the UN General Assembly has just called for Soviet withdrawal from Afghanistan. Next month, a new round of talks on this question takes place, also under United Nations auspices. If these talks are to succeed, the Soviets must provide a timetable for getting out and recognize that the freedom fighters will not be conquered. On bilateral and human rights questions, there were some small encouraging steps before the summit and in the agreements we reached there to promote people-to-people -people contacts. In both areas, we're hoping greater steps will follow. As I also told the Congress, human rights is a true peace issue. If there's one conclusion to draw from our fireside summit, it's that American policies are working. In a real sense, preparations for the summit started five years ago when, with the help of Congress, we began strengthening our economy, restoring our national will, and rebuilding our defenses and alliances. America is strong again, and American strength has caught the Soviets' attention. They recognize that the United States is no longer just reacting to world events. We are in the forefront of a powerful, historic tide for freedom and opportunity, for progress and peace. There's never been a greater need for courage and steadiness than now. Our strategic modernization program is an incentive for the Soviets to negotiate in earnest. But if Congress fails to support the vital defense efforts needed, then the Soviets will conclude that America's patience and will are paper thin and the world will become more dangerous again. Courage and steadiness are all important for freedom fighters too. I made it clear in Geneva that America embraces all those who resist tyranny and struggle for freedom. Breaking faith with freedom fighters would signal that aggression carries no risk, and this we will not allow. My fellow Americans, we're entering a season of hope. If we remain resolute for freedom and peace, if we keep faith with God, then our American family, 238 million strong, will even more be even more to be thankful for next year. Again, it's wonderful to be home. So until next week, thanks for listening, and God bless you. That's about three seconds long. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> we, we don't know what it is. Yeah, I'll just say it's already one. You're a great subject for public diplomacy. It's very easy to do. Thank you. Phil's a good part of an historic event. Thank you for well, thank you for part of it. I thank everybody who's, like you, been so much a part of making it successful. Thank you, Congress. Mr. President, we probably ought to get a couple individual photos. Oh. photos. Yes, I'll be there when you arrive. <laughs> okay. Thank you again. Right. You bet. Thank you.